everyone, you're sailing on Olive's Ark. I'm Taylor, and today we're gonna to be talking about how to pick the perfect classroom pet. So before we start, just so you know I am, I'm Taylor and I am a high school biology teacher. I also teach things like AP biology, integrated science, animal science. Um, I'm kind of in the life sciences here and so because of that I've had many classroom pets and I still have a lot of them today. Um, but I want to help you pick out a classroom pet because as a teacher, um, it's like my mission that teachers who keep classroom pets keep them in better than ideal conditions and the reason is your students see you as an expert. They look to you for advice, they look to you for expert help, and part of that is if they see you keeping a class pet in a certain way, they're going to think that's okay. Two things to keep in mind is the kind of teacher you are. Do you teach in a um, mature classroom or in a hectic classroom? And I break it into those two categories because you could teach in a elementary and have it be a very mature, quiet classroom. And you could teach in a high school room and have it be, be very hectic and loud kind of gauge the noise level and the type of handling you want your kids to be able to have. If you are choosing a new pet or you've never had a classroom pet before, let's go ahead and pick one for you guys today. Uh, one really, really, really cool one, which would do good in any classroom, whether it's high school, elementary, or middle school, is the morning gecko, which I've already made a video on. So I really suggest watching that, and that just might be it, right? So um, I'll put it up in the iCards, but the morning gecko is really a great choice. But let's go ahead and go through some typical class pets, right? Which are the small and fuzzy animals. Traditionally, like decades now, teachers have brought in class pets and they're usually the small and fuzzy, right? So like hamsters, rabbits, guinea pigs, chinchillas, small little fuzzy things like that. So let's talk about the one that you probably shouldn't have no matter what kind of classroom you're in, even if it is a like the quietest senior class ever, you don't want to keep this animal in your classroom, and that's a hamster. Um, what I've found is hamsters are very sensitive to um, noise, they're sensitive to light, to smell, and a classroom, no matter how nice it may seem, is not going to be good for a hamster. Uh, they're also nocturnal, which means they're not going to come out. The next one is a good one, which is a rabbit. So a rabbit is on a little bit of both sides for me. With a rabbit, I've seen instances where um, adult rabbits have been adopted and brought into a classroom and they don't do well. And I think honestly it's because they weren't raised in that environment. So as an adult rabbit, they are not used to the loud noises, to the constant handling, to whatever is going on. And so they, they tend to not thrive that well. But I think rabbits could be a good classroom pet. They're a little larger in size, which means they're easier to hold. The, the caveat I have with a rabbit is two things. One, that if you're gonna bring one into your classroom, you should bring a younger rabbit in so that it gets raised in that environment and that it becomes used to it. Because I've seen rabbits in classrooms that are just completely thriving and the kids love it. So I think if you're gonna get a rabbit, you need to raise it in the room. And secondly, rabbits need a lot more space than you probably think they do. Um, the, the cages they sell in pet stores are not even hardly big enough for a guinea pig, let alone a rabbit. Rabbits could use whole size rooms to themselves. Um, if you don't know about it, look up free roaming rabbits. One that's even better than a rabbit is a guinea pig, and so I really like guinea pigs. I think guinea pigs are a good choice because they're more social and more um, willing to interact than I think a rabbit would be. You could adopt an adult guinea pig and I think it would adjust pretty well. Guinea pigs are also very social and you can keep them in pairs, and you actually should keep them in pairs. So you can also have two class pets uh, for about the same size that you would keep a rabbit in. They still need a lot more room than uh, would seem. Again, guinea pig cages are not the best. You should still keep a guinea pig in a cage, but a bigger cage. Um, so but I leave that to you to look up. Those three are okay. Hamster not okay at all, but guinea pigs and rabbits are okay. My favorite, favorite, favorite small and furry animal to keep in a classroom is a mouse. You could do a rat, but let me tell you why I like mice. Mice are so much better because they can be kept in smaller containers, still bigger, uh, maybe like a 40 gallon breeder sized fish tank for a couple mice. Uh, female mice are social, so you can keep multiple female mice together. You could have um, 
something big for a mouse, but small compared to other animals. So you don't need the space you do for a guinea pig or a rabbit. They're also awake in the daytime, so unlike the hamster, they're gonna be awake on that wheel running. And I think the point of a class pet is to show students how to do proper care, um, compassion for an animal, and also to learn using real life examples. And I think a mouse is a great way to do that. Now downside to small and fuzzy animals is that you have to take care of them every single day, which means on weekends, every weekend, you're taking that animal home. You have to take the animal home. You just don't wanna do that. Teacher life is a busy life. So let's talk about like low maintenance animals. Uh, that are very easy to take care of with, with minimal care. Reptiles. So reptiles are by far, hands down, my favorite classroom pet of choice. Besides mice, I really do like mice. Uh, but reptiles have the most variety, uh, most choices, almost, uh, there's a huge group of reptiles you can choose from. Uh, and if you break it down into three categories of most common, you have snakes, lizards, and turtles. Um, of the three, I would eliminate turtles because turtles, again, you can't really handle too much. They need a lot of space. They need, um, depending on the turtle, but any kind of turtle, it needs at least a 75 gallon tank, and that's for tiny turtles, right? Um, and the turtles do kind of tend to smell um, because they poop in the water and then it's like soupy poop water and so it's not it's not the best smelling thing um, so turtles for me I would never keep in a classroom uh, but snakes and lizards yes 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 so let's talk about snakes first uh, number one I would recommend a corn snake corn snakes come in a lot of colors they're naturally very friendly. They have very, very extremely low like bite, bite ratio, bite, biting, I don't know. They don't bite. So um, corn snakes are pretty cool. Um, and the reason I like it is if you're okay with keeping it, students actually get um, more exposure to reptiles because there's a lot of stigma and fear around reptiles. And if you're okay with it and you can show students that they're okay, They'll actually like over time kind of get used to it and maybe one day they'll want to hold it or touch it. The only caveat is they do eat mice for the most part. There's egg eating snakes and insect eating snakes. Those probably aren't good classroom pets. So we're going to stick to the corn snake which does eat mice. But there is a new thing in the reptile community that we're also pushing for is to not feed your snake live mice. So you can order mice online. They're like frozen food. They just like six mice in a package. You keep them in your freezer like you do your frozen food and it's just every two weeks when it's feeding time you thaw out a mouse and you dangle it and the snake will grab it because it thinks it's alive and it can smell the scent of the mouse so you actually don't have to feed living mice and I think that might convince more people to get snake now let's talk about my personal favorite classroom pet my leopard gecko so this is amoeba she's my leopard gecko and look how pretty she is and when I teach sometimes not all the time she gets to sit on my shoulder and so she's like a nice little accessory piece. Not that I treat her like one, but it, it's an animal that you can have out as you're teaching and I think it draws attention to you, honestly. Sometimes as a teacher, you know, students don't want to pay attention, but this will definitely have them looking up at you at least. Another good lizard to pick from is like a bearded dragon. Bearded dragons though need a lot of space, so again at least a 75 gallon. Um, and they have a little bit more care needs, just a little bit. Leopard geckos are really easy and they're a lot smaller. I would keep one comfortably in a 40 gallon breeder tank. The only thing is they just need to be fed a little more often, but you're exchanging it for you don't have to feed it mice, right? So these eat insects, I feed mine mealworms and roaches. You could also feed crickets. She was a rescue and does not know how to eat a cricket. They never bite, ever. I've never had a leopard gecko bite me, ever. So um, they're a safe animal and they're, they're really clean too and they're really smooth. There's never any like dirt or slime on them. Um, with any animal you wanna practice proper sanitation. So I know sometimes with reptiles there's like the salmonella scare. Just wash your hands after handling it and it'll be fine. But I did forget to mention leopard geckos eat twice a week about, that's what I feed her, which means you don't have to bring them home on weekends. But on breaks like winter break, I do bring her home. 
but to kind of solve the solution of dragging a, a tank back and forth, especially a 40 gallon. Um, I have her large tank at school. She stays there 90% of the year and then just the two months of the summer, she stays here at this house and I have a 15 gallon she stays in. Uh, that's one way around it. You could just keep a smaller tank at home in your garage and then when it's time to bring it home, you just bring that out. It's only temporary and then the nice fancy mansion cage can stay at school. Let's talk about the pets that have no care. There's pets that I can have in my classroom that don't need any care? Yes, there's two. One is an aquarium and the other's the terrarium. So the aquarium is a good first choice. And these require, I say like 1% care. So the way you make this no care for a fish tank is you want it to be like a fully functioning ecosystem. That means you need to have uh, fish, you need to have food for the fish, something to eat the fish poop, recycle that for the plants, help the plants grow, which provide food for the fish, and it just creates a cycle, right? You wanna create a food chain, basically, a food web in your fish tank. And if you can do that, it's gonna self-sustain. I will say too, it's easier to control a fish tank that's at least 40 gallons, maybe 30. 10 and 20 gallons are too small. They can function, they'll work, but you'll have a lot more trouble kind of keeping them balanced. And the other tank, that requires no maintenance, like none, is the terrarium. And so a terrarium is essentially just an empty tank, but you just do live plants. And I know you're thinking, well, I wanted a pet. I wanted something for my kids to look at. Plants are something to look at. This is cool as it is, guys. Like, even if I didn't have my, my lizards in here, this looks cool to look at. And it also, like I said, you're, you're a teacher. You should be educating your students, and it's all about showing them other choices in the world. Just because something is a boring plant doesn't mean it has to be boring. Make a terrarium with carnivorous plants. Put in Venus flytraps. Terrariums can be cool by themselves. And you can make it like a jungle terrarium or a desert terrarium. You could have both. And terrariums could be as small as a mason jar, guys. They could be as big as a full tank like this. So terrariums are a really good place to start. And because terrariums could be small and there's not, not really any live animals to um, kind of worry about, you can actually place terrariums at table groups and have those groups responsible for that terrarium. So one will be responsible for the tropical terrarium, the coniferous terrarium, the um, coastal terrarium, the desert terrarium. Have your groups responsible for their terrarium. If you are a science, STEM, elementary, something type of room, you can do tests and science experiments on this. If you're an English teacher, you can do journal write-ups and use your terrariums as inspiration. If you're a math teacher, do terrariums on the dimensions, measure the growth of the plant and, and track the growth on a graph. If you are a history teacher, talk about the importance of logging information throughout history. Why do we do species names? Why are we writing down this information? What did Darwin do in history that influenced other laws and policies? Any class can have a class pet, specifically a terrarium. And terrariums are cool because if you do little mason jar ones at the end of the year, like summertime, and you don't want a bunch of terrariums to take home, give them to your students. And if you want your terrarium to have a little bit of life, you can add insects into it. Um, you could do terrariums with ladybugs, with pill bug, roly polies, stick bugs, um, praying mantises. But my most favorite is the roly poly or the pill bug, the sow bug, the isopod. And here's why. And let me show you a cheap terrarium. So this box is from the dollar store. If you open your terrarium and look inside, there's life. So this is my little pill bug terrarium. They're very, very cool. They're fun to watch. And what they do is they eat dead and rotting matter. So that's why you can kind of see them hanging out around those dead leaves. The dead leaves are in there on purpose. And I never have to do anything for these guys because it's sealed. There's just a little bit of air pockets on the side. And this is why I really like terrariums because it's a fun way to kind of introduce yourself to the class pet to see how your students would treat this. Do they have an interest in a class pet? Because like I said, this is how you can set rules. Like, when can class pets be taken out? When they can, when can they be handled? And as you get more comfortable, then you can get something a little larger, more complicated, like a mouse. But students have already learned the rules with this original one, right? 
So I hope that helped you guys. Now I have one thing I want to know from you. If you're a teacher and you have a class pet, leave a comment below. I'm always interested in getting more ideas. So comment below with your class pet. If you're a student and your teacher has a class pet, also comment what they have. And like the video. Like if you have a class pet. Go ahead and subscribe. And we post new videos every Friday. And that means I will see you in one week. Bye!